Dear colleagues, it is a pleasure to welcome you to this important conversation today. I want to start with some sobering figures that underline the importance of this discussion about resilient and sustainable health infrastructure. Around the world, an estimated 1 billion people are served by health facilities without access to electricity or with very unreliable access. Only half of the hospitals in Sub-Saharan Africa have access to reliable electricity. And we know that while larger hospitals might have access to more reliable power, the problem is much more acute for rural and remote health clinics. Reliable electricity in healthcare facilities is vital to saving lives and to universal health knowledge. Sustainable energy is an urgent need in the confluence of the crisis that humanity is facing. From the climate crisis to the ongoing conflicts and the threat of a novel pandemic, health systems are facing increasing risks. And the need to build resilient, sustainable, and inclusive health infrastructure with reliable access to energy has never been more pertinent. The organization that I lead, UNOX, has a focus on implementation. Our role is to help our partners, whether it is the United Nations, governments, regional or international partners, to implement projects that advance the sustainable development goals. And much of what we do takes place in remote, fragile and conflict affected areas. Support for health related SDGs constitutes a key part of our delivery. We work with our partners to scale up innovative and sustainable health infrastructure, health procurement and health program implementation projects to accelerate the <coughs> achievement of the SDG 3 and beyond. And we are proud to work in a partnership with WHO and others to implement solutions particularly in low and middle income countries that address the climate health nexus. What we are doing this by assessing, designing, and implementing solar power solutions for urban and rural uh, health facilities. From Sierra Leone to Yemen, our long experience in this area speaks to our commitment to leaving no one behind. Everything we do, we do in partnerships. And today's event is a testimony to the importance of the right partnerships for better health outcomes. There is a wealth of experience here from countries that have made positive strides to invest in the, and strengthen their health systems by prioritizing solar energy to power their health infrastructure. I truly look forward to hearing more about these experiences and learning how together we can build a better and healthier future for all. So good evening, excellent ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Louise Leach. Um, I'm the head of the UNOX Liaison Office uh, here in Geneva. And I'd like to add my warm welcome to that of um, Mr. George Da Silva, our new executive director, um, and welcome you to this event. Uh, I really want to keep my introductions and comments to an absolute minimum because we have 60 minutes. Um, and I really want to focus on this uh, key topic of conversation at the moment, energizing health. Um, and particularly as we're seeing increasing impacts of climate change on people's health and well-being really all around the planet. So without further ado, I'm really pleased to introduce our distinguished panel this evening. We've got um, Her Excellency Dr. Leah Padete, Minister of Health of Ethiopia, uh, His Excellency Dr. Ali Hajiadan Abubakar, Minister of Health of Somalia, uh, Dr. Tamar Rabi, the Global Specialist in Health at the World Bank, uh, Dr. Maria Nira, the Director of Environment and Climate Change and Health at WHO Headquarters, and uh, Ms. Jalila Gonzalez, our Acting Regional Director of Africa at UNOS. Um, unfortunately, His Excellency Dr. Denby, Minister of Health of Sierra Leone, was uh, unable to join us for this event in Geneva. Um, unfortunately, he had the previous commitments. So please, panel, welcome. So, first of all, I'd like to uh, hand over to Maria Nira from WHO, who really sort of provides some introductory comments about the whole climate and health space right now. Maria, your podium is yours, unless you want to say that. <laughs> well, I'm inspiring. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
first of all, thank you so much, for, uh, sorry, I should be a little bit more formal. Thank you all for being here this evening. I don't know about you, but I love this title, Energizing Health. I, I, I think it, we should stop the meeting right now because it's not <laughs> clear what we mean by that. You know, energizing Health. It's clear that the best energy ever is the human energy. And if it's positive, even better. Mm -hmm. and renewable mind is about to collapse, but uh, still it's a very renewable energy. No, seriously, I, I was so pleased that your executive director started the intro introduction mentioning the key messages about one billion people not having access to reliable energy sources at the healthcare facility. And sorry to remind all of you, I'm a medical doctor, so I know what a healthcare facility is. And not having electricity at a healthcare facility is really something that's uh, it's a shame that in 2022 we are still talking about that, but it's a reality for 50% of the healthcare facilities in Sub Saharan uh, Africa. They do not have very, very, uh, reliable sources of energy. So, my colleague Salvatore Vinci is going to kill me if I don't show this fantastic <laughs> report from where this incredible data is coming from. I'm sure they will thank uh, Kim and Rudy very pleased as well as I joined the effort. But this is really a, a big document, 250 pages. This is just a executive summary, but don't worry, you are not uh, obliged to read it. But we can obtain very, very good information. Three minutes I have, I know. Three messages. First message, I don't understand why we don't have solar panels in all places in, in Africa and all healthcare facilities. But this maybe me personally, but being work, I worked in Africa for five years, so I don't see the reason why today we still have this problem of access to energy in healthcare facilities. So I think the solar energy can save this incredible gap, uh, uh, something that we cannot explain and change completely the, the, the situation of the moment. This is the first one. And we need to do that, obviously, with an operational maintenance. I mean, myself working in Africa many years ago, we don't need to say how many, it's not important. <laughs> but some years ago, and I saw many solar panels at the time, but no maintenance. This time we will do it with a very serious operational maintenance. The second thing, we are not just talking about gaining access to electricity for healthcare facilities, we are talking about the medical devices that go with that. The need of the standardization of all the medical devices and equipment that we need, we need there. So this is my second message. Uh, and I think, again, this is where the energy sector and the health sector, finally, they talk the same languages. We are not just responding the, to the needs of the energy sector and then solarizing and putting solar panels. No, this time the demand is coming from the health sector and we will have mm -hmm. conversations and dialogue and engagement of the energy sector. So we will be energizing the health or healthy buying the energy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. But anyway, you see what I mean. The third one is that our healthcare facilities are so dependent these days on diesel. You know, we have this uh, discussion about pandemic preparedness. So our health centers, they need to function, they need to operate, they need to put vaccines, they need to be able to respond to the different uh, emergencies. And for that, when they don't have electricity, what do they do? They have the engines functioning with the diesel. So we are spending millions on diesel. Why uh, or why we should use that money to do uh, more strategic and common sense investment? So, and of course, the second part is that this will contribute as well for more climate resilient, reduce emissions clearly, and climate resilient again is the critical role. And that reducing the cost, the nonsense cost that we are having now by paying diesel that keep us and the, the health professionals working in the healthcare facility depending very much on the diesel supply, on the prices of the diesel. And, and, and I think I know, uh, I, I mean, you all know very well what I'm talking about. So let's change completely that. For the first time ever this year, as you know, at the COP28, we will have a health day. Mm -hmm. And president, so we need to take advantage of that and bring the health argument on more action on climate change. 
part of that would be by solarizing and making sure that we have our healthcare facilities gaining access to clean sources of energy. Thank you. Thanks very much, Maria. That's really, I mean, it's insightful, and I love hearing you speak. It's about passion, it's about energy, and it's really about bringing people together. And we've been hearing a lot this week at the World Health Assembly um, at various events on climate and health, which has definitely been a real uh, a real theme. We've heard the calls for stronger leadership. We've heard about more organized financing. We've heard about collaborative innovation um, and really a need to accelerate and scale up the interventions that we know already work. Um, and we're really dealing with an incredible threat to public health and well-being right now. And I think we're seeing it more, more now than ever. So this evening, we really want to explore some of the concrete examples um, and UNOPS is working, as you heard, in partnerships to operationalize some of these interventions. Um, and we really want to uh, hear from the countries that are making these smart in investments. Um, and we really want to, you know, have that conversation about how we're harnessing solar energy um, and really powering these resilient, sustainable health systems in the future. Um, and we want to involve all of you in this conversation too. So we're going to reflect on lessons. We're going to talk about acceleration, scaling up, um, and more importantly, as Maria touched upon, really about sustaining these interventions and making sure that these investments are going much, much further. So I mentioned that unfortunately, Minister Demby from Sierra Leone was unable to join us. But however, we have His Excellency uh, Dr. Lansana Berry, the ambassador uh, from Sierra Leone to Switzerland and the UN here in Geneva. Um, and you've kindly agreed, thank you, to uh, deliver the minister's uh, intervention. So, Ambassador, please, you have the podium. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, hello, ministers. I, I, I would like to have revealed it, but I'm not allowed to. Uh, yeah. <laughs> that's what the minister sent to me. Uh, Honorable Minister, Excellencies, uh, distinguished um, delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm very honored to participate in this event on behalf of my minister, a good friend, uh, the Honorable Dr. Austin Demby, who could not be here with us today, discussing the role of clean and sustainable and I need to ensure the resil resilient public health and sustainable healthcare systems. The early is vulnerable to climate change. And of course, climate change brings significant health impacts. Changes in flooding, rainfall patterns, droughts in Sierra Leone adversely affects human health. Countries' national ad adaptation plans to get the flooding has increased and, and was, as we know, blood increased the number of people mm -hmm. exposed to water bomb diseases. We do have a uh, uh, cholera year after year. And then last night, a uh, uh, terrible flood in Britain actually brought down the most iconic uh, tree in the Sierra Leone, the cotton tree, uh, which has been standing there for about 500 years wow. and was the, uh, the main shelter for the priest ladies who were. Sent to Sierra Leone to uh, build a new nation. Unfortunately, Sierra Leone has also been as well been affected by uh, other outbreaks, pandemics, Ebola. And according to the WHO, the significant rise in the Ebola outbreaks in Africa is linked to climate change. As we see more of these events, we can expect a continuous heavy toll on public health in the countries. Uh, the digital health system. Poor health affects economic growth and the ability of households to increase their income. <laughs> health shocks also limit households' ability to save and invest in income generating assets. Beyond the microeconomic consequences of poor health of household income and the disease environment and the ability to combat disease outbreaks are critical to overall economic growth. Transforming the health sector from an under resource ill-equipped and inadequate delivery system into a well-resourced, functioning, resilient national health care delivery system that is affordable for everyone and accessible to all the strategic objective of Sierra Leone's medium-term national development plan 2019-2023. Accessing critical health care without a reliable source of power is hardship that has been an also common reality 
hundreds of thousands of people in Sierra Leone. This position that breaks up has been the job of healthcare workers much lengthy. If you are following the Twitter account of Dr. Davis, the uh, he unveiled a number of solar uh, projects that will support the healthcare system. So address is the provision of adequate electricity and power from renewable and clean sources terminals. This is also a strategic objective of Sierra Leone's uh, medium term development plan. The government of Sierra Leone has responded to these challenges with forward thinking interventions and strengthening our energy infrastructure, prioritizing healthcare facilities. The key intervention of the first FCEO on the renewable, believe I don't know what it means, on the renewable energy projects implemented by UNOPS and through the use of mini grids, free electricity was provided to 97 community health centers, mm -hmm. solar power across 12 districts in Sierra Leone. I mentioned uh, that they may on the benefiting hundreds of thousand people. This has continued as you know, and we are very grateful for that. Uh, it's currently implementing a new project on behalf of the government of Sierra Leone, funding from the World Bank, which includes uh, this solarization of additional 200 health facilities across the country. These are health facilities which are not going to be electrified through grid essential in the next five years. It is impossible to have that, that infrastructure. So thank you. Uh, there is no doubt that solar energy can improve the access and quality of health care. It is clear that Sierra Leone and Africa are fully committed to using renewable sources to achieve universal energy access. Renewable energy can help improve access to health care. For example, in remote areas of Sierra Leone, off-grid solar electricity primary health care facilities now allows for procedures that we are not used to before because no energy sources are available. For women, it means they can deliver their babies in better conditions and reduce complications. Renewable energy also significantly contributes to the quality of healthcare. A very clear example of this is at least to maintain the cold chain of vaccines and medicine. This requires refrigeration, cold rooms, and IC systems to carry out stock management. It also requires continuous power Quality of healthcare is also closely linked to staff morale and staff retention and having electricity in the health facilities and the community support this too. One of the successes has been the government of Sierra Leone's commitment to prioritize renewable energy as part of its strategic commitment to access energy for all and to create policy to frame and support sustainable renewable energy access. In the country. Having this enabling environment has been critical to the sustainability of the investment. Solarization of health facilities alone is not the solution. It is critical that access to renewable solar energy is provided to communities as well as to businesses in order to promote economic growth. Unique Greece and Sierra Leone offer substantial opportunities for private sector involvement. The Rural Renewable Energy Project and UNOPS mentioned on behalf of the government of Sierra Leone and which these policies and regulations will generate strong private sector engagement in the mini grid market in Sierra Leone, particularly around tariffs, licenses, and national grid arrival. These are positions Sierra Leone at the forefront of the sector in South Southern Africa. We look forward to continuing this partnership with UNOPS and other stakeholders of like the bill and accelerate our efforts on the implementation of innovative health and climate nexus initiatives. I thank you all for your attention. And um, so it's sweet to say, my, I, I have doctor prefix place in my name, but that's not a medical doctor. Thank you very much, Dr. Dem. <laughs>
to look at some of the projects now in Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, and Somalia. Uh, and it's a short video. Uh, really, we want to have a look at some of these projects in action um, and see some of the partners and the people involved in the projects. The ability of energy in the villages in times like this nature, makes it possible for them to preserve vaccines and provide life for midwives and those they labor. Well, for my part, one of the years of the time, I think it's called the potential patient in our next. But also, I don't know, it'll be easy for me now. Well, they do treatments, even to general patient and into the patient recovery continuum. What's really great about the electricity that we provide, the solar, is that it powers every need in the community, ranging from clinics to hospitals, to houses, to businesses. Um, we really power the electricity that people need to thrive. Like when it is like what it is seems to, I get please I will put down so I will pull it in there, I get more customer. Access to power enable us to store how so many really nice. So very simple guy like the when my life say you are not not on fight. Ethiopia, a country where health, education, social welfare, and many other aspects of human well-being are marked by wide disparities. Also Ethiopia, a land of natural beauty, incredible animals, enticing beaches, beautiful ancient cities, archaeological monuments, geological wonders, and amazing people. In Ethiopia, the government is working to reduce inequalities and promote healthier lives across the country. Part of this involves transforming the health system to improve the quality of healthcare and ensure accessibility to all. The Ministry of Health, together with UNOPS and other partners, is helping to achieve these goals. UNOPS has installed solar power systems at more than 160 health centers. Now in the country, over 1,800 healthcare facilities work with solar energy. In partnership with CODCA, UNOPS has constructed hand washing facilities at more than 20 health centers. With support from the government of Japan, UNOPS has built two boreholes, a water reservoir, 18 water points, and improvised pit latch 
trends to enhance access to clean water for more than 24,000 internally displaced people living in Koroji, the largest camp in Ethiopia. The Ministry of Health is also working to ensure that medical waste can be disposed of safely. And UNOPS is helping by building eight incinerators in line with international environmental standards. The Ethiopian government and UNOPS work together to ensure that no one is left behind in achieving the sustainable development goals. And that Ethiopia always looks more like this. So now we can get an answer. <laughs> and I think 60 minutes really does clear it doesn't. So we look at the scope and the scale of the work that's been undertaken in your countries and the investments that have been made. It's, it's, it's so important. Uh, so I think really we want to uh, hear from you. Uh, and perhaps we'll start with the, the ministers. So um, perhaps you could explain or maybe just share a little bit some of the um, what you see actually are the direct and the broader impacts um, of these solarization investments. Um, and, and the effects that are having uh, and, and the, the benefits of those walks for country. Uh, perhaps, um, Minister Public. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for, first of all, for uh, this very important topic of innovative health and education, which is it has two critical uh, uh, issues that was as one is is the obvious of having uh, the basic needs of electricity and of course water to expand you know, this part of it like the basic needs of electricity for and facilities to provide that care daily but at the same time making sure that it also um, is uh entering the climate change uh, challenge we are all facing in our countries so overall as a country uh, the, the climate change is bringing a lot of other risks and uh, we're facing uh, floods with over and under uh, water that will be a uh, challenge for different outbreaks, humanitarian, uh, and many challenges. But also, beyond that, as I mentioned earlier, this is fundamental issue that so providing the quality of care we can imagine what kind of service in uh, health worker can delivery or vaccination or any service that they can provide without power and electricity. So, uh, we have been as, as government and as nation and we are investing in, in, in uh, energizing with our support of our partners, stakeholders, and the government itself. And uh, being a big, a big country, uh, we have a different health care system where we have around 17,000 health schools across the country and uh, 4,000 health centers and uh, 400 hospitals. And, uh, uh, as was mentioned in the video, uh, we have been invested in uh, the solar energy infrastructure with support of our different partners in government, uh, one of which are about 100, and some which are already also on pipeline under the construction. Given that more, uh, a large number of our facilities are off grid and they cannot get access to electricity, the investment uh, with, with solar energy is really critical. Quickly make sure that they have the, the power they need. They can sustain it because of the, the, the demands and electricity demands that we are doing the direct electricity. And the resources requires to really achieve that is uh, it's, uh, too long. And uh, definitely uh, also addresses issues of uh, uh, climate change. And uh, in addition, this, this investment, so it's not just only on the solar, uh, which has the obvious uh, access, but also we have been investing on uh, water and uh, sanitation facilities. Access to water is a big challenge for our facilities. So, in Sushan, one, we work in priority, which we are working with different uh, sectors, especially water and energy. This two is a major priority. Uh, different projects we have the one wash national program supported by different donors for other donors. And uh, <clears throat> we also recently have another project with uh, again with support and education and the finance to uh, equip health and education facilities uh, with a SIP support, which we call water for life, but have a component of energy. 
and one unique aspect of it is that it includes private sector engagement in terms of really going out to this, this uh, uh, energy, electrification for the uh, energy as uh, well as the And the other is, of course, uh, uh, I also think really a little bit of the so, so the energy. And the, of the big challenge we have is for our health force, which have the, the most uh, level of uh, uh, and facility which has existential worker the community worker to provide immunization services. So achieving that uh, in the short time to make sure that they can have access to electricity is difficult. So we are with the support of Africa the Garden and collaboration of the UNICEF providing the solar directly to the refrigerators. Mm -hmm. So my, my large number of our health posts are now having those uh, to provide the immunization services they really need, but uh, actually in the whole chain of, of those which also have the impact of uh, the climate of Syrians or those facilities. So the, the, the impact definitely is far reaching in terms of in ensuring access to the quality of, of services. And if you can imagine the challenge, for example, to give the vaccination without having this, this uh, uh, analysis. So it's, High impact on the part of the but at the same time, the approach should be also the way where we can mitigate at least not doing harm in terms of the investments we do in terms of the climate that's here. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, that's one thing. I mean, and in terms of both the duality, I think going back to answer the answer is really it's great that you're working with COP, but that it's really bringing the project to a bigger scale. Um, and perhaps we need to add that. Uh, uh, we reflect on the project in Somalia. Thank you. Please, uh, uh, Somalia really uh, is poor country and, uh, in terms of uh, available resources for treaty country, in terms of potential resources, recovering from uh, uh, civil war for decades. And now I think against the war. So, uh, there is uh, the electricity, the energy, very high, the cost of energy is very high in Somalia. Uh, the bill of electricity in one hospital may become 100 US dollars. So some hospitals, uh, especially public hospitals, cannot pay the bill of energy and electricity. So for us in Somalia, uh, solarization, health facilities is life saving for us. Uh, one of the examples uh, is uh, now we are running uh, oxygen plants or oxygen solar in some of our buildings. And ICU may also, uh, ICU, uh, we can also uh, make ICU functional by using products. Uh, so uh, there is World Bank funded projects now aiming to solarize the public health facilities and public public health facilities and public schools. We hope that uh, by solarizing all health public health facilities, we hope that we can reduce the uh, suffering of the people. Uh, we can also increase uh, the mortality rate of the other and uh, If we uh, able uh, or succeed to solarize all the services, then we hope it will become a uh, reality of the future in the new. It also will reduce the air emissions and also uh, will develop the create economic development by creating new jobs for you. So we see. Possibly, we have it has positive impact mm -hmm. on life saving and the survival of the system. It's really important that we have a broader contact with the population and the country as well to train people to work in the sector of the society and use more important to them. So, perhaps turning to Daniela and mm -hmm. Maria, who are coming from a a slightly different perspective, maybe um, your experience on the impact of these types of projects. Uh, maybe okay. 
So I feel so inspired with all of these examples. And mm -hmm. thanks so much for putting the video together. So I don't need to go through that because it's really, really self explanatory. So I lived in Africa for 23 years. I'm not a doctor, but I am an engineer. Mm -hmm. And I worked in the renewable energy pipe before joining the NOPS. So I think that I am surrounded by doctors, except you, who <laughs> <laughs> know very well how, how you know, a well a health center should be. And I, I, I know it's just from a, a user perspective, but I know very well, you know, how the renewable energy technology and solutions, you know, should be. And to be very honest, I don't really, similar to Maria, I don't understand why it is taking so long, you know, to ensure that we provide renewable energy solutions to all of the health care facilities in Africa. I don't understand. I think that this should be a development priority for all of us. And there is no need to wait because we are ready. The technology is there. And I can assure you, it's there and it is easy and it is really not, not expensive. And the impact that it has, it makes the difference between life and death. So there is no need for us to wait. Let's make it happen. Let's ensure that it's done. We cannot wait for the connection to the grid. There is no need. We can really provide these off grid, small uh, uh, mini power solutions that really make the difference between life and death. In terms of impact, I think it is self explanatory. By connecting and by providing renewable energy solutions to healthcare centers, we ensure reliable energy, stable energy. It makes a difference in all of the components, from the lighting to communications to uh, providing power to medical equipment, as Maria was mentioning. It makes a, it makes a difference. Second, it is clean energy. Therefore, it reduces the drops, the, the, the CO2 emissions. Third, it allows countries and health uh, care facilities not to be not really rely on grids that most of the time it is not reliable, and also not to rely on diesel and mm -hmm. be, be less dependent on diesel on diesel on diesel generate. And of course, it's it's also a way of empowering you know women, and it is also a way of reducing inequalities. If women live near or close to a health center that has reliable energy, of course, we will go to the health center to deliver. Therefore, it will reduce uh, the mortality rate as well as to bring their kids to the, uh, uh, to, the, to, the to that health center. So there is no need to wait. We are ready to go. The technology is there. I am the renewable energy specialist. <laughs> Let's make it happen, please. <laughs> So many of you have so much momentum as well. I think this is uh, I think it's the most thrill of the most organization. I'm glad you mentioned Gabby there in the audience. So it's very good to have uh, you know, the key part of this and hearing this momentum with Maria. Um, so your perspective impact at the global level. Uh, First of all, I'm, I'm very happy as well that you mentioned Gary because we are certainly most of the experience of the projects we are developing now is a sphere that is coming from the cold chain that uh, the Gavi colleagues, Karen is here, but uh, the Gavi colleagues and, and UNICEF and others have been developing and learning from that. This is where the question was okay, why we don't do something different and we upgrade the capacity of the solar panel and instead of providing electricity to maintain the call the vaccine, let's do something for the for the the whole health facility. I think we are on a on a very sweet momentum, if I can call it like that, on, on a scale in that. And I think that the experience in Somalia that we have as the show with the the, the, the other partners of course and then uh, Providing electricity to the healthcare facilities is so rewarding. I mean, you mentioned some benefits in terms of health, but we could give an enormous list. Uh, you can perform a cleaning on a surgical intervention, but you can't uh, disinfect the least. You can uh, obviously make uh, sure that you have a minimum of uh, vaccine uh, uh, refrigerator function, but in a 
contribution to that and also to concentrate, uh, you name it, uh, you, know, you need to have electricity. It, it didn't manage the security of the uh, uh, professionals and the, the kind of um, security you need to your patients as well. You need to treat the patients with a lamp of kerosene is not very nice. And, 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 I've been doing that, and it's not very nice. Um, so I'm, I'm very happy to hear that uh, there is a commitment, and uh, the experiences of Ethiopia, the experiences of Somalia, the experiences in Uganda, in Sierra Leone, I mean, uh, there will be many others following. I think we are on a very critical moment now. You saw it at the World Health Assembly. The ministers of health are ready. They, they, they heard in the, the week the importance of in placing climate change and health very high in the agenda. And if you want to contribute to reduce the problems caused by climate change, and the, the climate sensitive diseases that we are going to have, one of the best investments we can do is to strengthen the healthcare facilities capacity. And one of the capacities we need is to have uh, safe water, sanitation, uh, electricity, all the medical devices that go with that. And being able to respond and to cope with this horrible wave that is coming and then represented by climate change. And at the same time, obviously, gaining access to a source of energy which is clean. So, we are, it's not that we need to decarbonize in, in Africa because Africa is not going to need to decarbonize. But you need to gain access to, to electricity. And to do that, let's do it on an intelligent way, on, mm -hmm. a, on a smart way, and in a way that makes the center, the health center, less dependent. Uh, they, they keep telling me the figures of the, the, the amount of uh, the millions that some very poor countries are spending on diesel. This is after the sector of this. And then, and in addition to that, now that we need to be better prepared to cope with uh, the horrible health. Hurricane that is coming due to, to the, the climate change, we better have a very resilient healthcare facility. So the samples are multiplying. We need just to be very aligned, very strategic on this alignment, mm -hmm. making sure that we define very well what we need and um, standardizing a little bit more, maybe particularly on the medical devices and all the the, the equipment that we need, that will be good as well on energy efficiency. This is what the engineers are telling me. But you know, doctors, we can learn from engineers. Engineers from doctors, I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, but we need that energy. And uh, we need to empower the health sector. And I'm so pleased to see two ministers talking about energy, ministers of health. You know, the moment this is happening, this is irreversible. <laughs> no, seriously. I mean, if ministers of health, instead of keeping talking permanently about disease, uh, because we, we in the health sector we tend to do that, we pretend that we do health, but we we do disease. And it, it, sometimes, in my colleagues of the World Health Organization, I tell you, we are the World Health Organization, not the World Disease Organization. Mm. So we need to work for health. And health means ministers of health talking about energy. I mean, it's amazing. I, I heard ministers of health in the last days as well talking about uh, planting trees because they know that otherwise the health facilities will disappear. At the end. So come on, finally, this famous uh, healthy all policies approach, mm -hmm. this intersectoral approach is coming and is coming in a very good way. Now, the next is to <laughs> <laughs> So I um, suppose the next question has to go. It is. Yes. Yeah. 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 And I think, you know, again, the impact of what we're all trying to achieve in the health sector is also somewhat supported by um, obviously the financing uh, underneath it. So Tama, maybe you can tell us a bit more about the bank. I know we've heard a lot about you uh, reorienting some of the grants and, and really sort of building up that whole concept of resilient financing as well, uh, not only for solarization, but, but beyond. So perhaps you could uh, just tell us what the bank's doing in this space as well. And he's a medical doctor, so he yeah, has so he no responsibility. Well, first of all, thanks so much for the invitation. Uh, for, for us to speak today and to, you know, to share also our experience and what the bank's doing and how we look at particularly you know, the, this issue around electrification and healthcare facilities. I want to start off perhaps with a personal experience first before going on to the whole bank experience. 
I'm Richard from Egypt, and I am an actor, and I have seen firsthand what it means not to have um, power supply in healthcare facilities, particularly in rural areas. And here we're talking about middle income countries. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So, and 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 it's it's devastating because you know the, the fact the matter is is people's lives as we heard. It is the difference between life and death. Um, it is the outcomes that the quality outcomes that we're talking about in terms of um, health. So when I, when I when I look at this and, and going into an organization like the bank, it just really feels like the electrification is um, is definitely a very important entry point to quality of care, enhancing access to healthcare services, dealing with the issues around inequality that we've heard. Um, also taking this into more of the wider, I would say, you know, um, impacts that have to do with economic development, um, labor productivity, growth. So there's so much that can be said. And I want to pick a few points from what we heard from the UNOPS executive director and also what uh, Maria Niera was reflecting on based on the, on the, on the very you know, famous report from, from Debbie Joe Maggie. Indeed, one billion people are beneficiaries of health services. But let's put it in perspective. In Sub-Saharan Africa, you're talking about, I put the numbers down, 25,000 healthcare facilities without access to electricity in the first place. Yeah, so this is not even about reliable, you know, electrical, um, you know, uh, power supply, but there is none whatsoever. And you've got around 68,000 with unreliable access. So that's that's a, a huge magnitude that we have to do something about it because you know we've heard also from our engineers well if they don't have these you know clean energy sources what do they do? They're gonna have to revert to fossil fuel energy sources to be able to, to power those facilities. <laughs> so the perhaps my, my my second message I got this is the three messages I'll be quick, but my second message is what has been the approach that the bank has been taking to be able to move on to this agenda? This is a um, this is a, a collaboration that happens inside the World Bank between our energy global practice and our health nutrition population global practice. And, and like Maria, I'm actually delighted that we have two ministers of health speaking energy. And we're trying to do the same thing also in the bank. So normally you would have seen an, an energy global practice colleague sitting on the panel from the bank. Mm -hmm. But it was, it's in fact, it, this in itself was, you know, an important statement to make that we in health are taking this very seriously. So we have a three pillar approach to how we, um, you know, move on to, onto this agenda. The first one is deploying off-grid solar um, solutions. And this is really with the mindset that you're moving towards decentralized, if you will, energy generation. The second pillar is in terms of promoting long-term operation and maintenance. So let's not forget the, the O&M part is a huge and important part. This is not just about installing the technology and then walking away. There's a huge element, and in fact, the reason I'm putting this on the table as well is because when our ministers are speaking to their um, counterparts in the Minister of Finance, there's a part that has to be included in budget and budget planning around o &M. So it's an important element to bring into the discussion. The third pillar is how do we intervene holistically around this? And this is about capacity development in, within, within, within our current countries. This is about health energy needs assessments that can also go beyond solarization. It could go into other renewable energy sources. Like Maria was saying, this is about investing in uh, medical devices and equipment and, and really being aware of the fact that electrification, um, it's not just of the, of the facility, but it's the entire service delivery model, if you will, that we have around it. It's about data. And improving data and um, you know the kind of information that you know is made available to us to be able to follow up obviously on, on implementation. And of course, it's the political commitment that we bring to the table. And I think this is huge. WHO has done a, an amazing job um, 
over um, not just actually the WHA, but even before that, but more so this WHA mm -hmm. in raising that political profile. And this is a great, you know, word of appreciation to our colleagues from the World Health Organization and how they pushed the agenda on climate and health up through WHA. I'm going to end on what we have done. We've heard of um, three fine examples of um, uh, how the World Bank has been supporting our client countries in moving on this agenda. I want to say that we're currently supporting the electrification of around well, 7,500 health facilities across the globe in 27 um, countries with an investment portfolio of approximately 300 million US dollars in Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, there's 20 countries. And um, in um, Sub-Saharan Africa, the, the investment portfolio is around 254 um, million. My final point is just to say that despite these figures that I'm, you know, I'm throwing out, this is still not enough. This is the financing gap that we have to fill to be able to really, you know, move quite aggressively on this agenda. And particularly this, as we've heard, um, it's simple, it's clean, um, it, it, it addresses so many different things. So this is going to require for us to think about innovative partnerships, how we move on innovative partnerships to, 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 to move to scale. This is going to require us, as we've heard, also to think more about the private sector, how that comes in into the equation. This is not just about the public sector acting on its own. Where is the role of the private sector in all of this? And I want to end a uh, very final point on this, just as a reminder to all of us that it's not a free <clears throat> service after all, because of the points that I mentioned previously, also on the operations of maintenance. Somebody's got to pay the bill. So we need to be able to understand how we move on that in a fiscally, I would say, healthy manner. So uh, thanks, and I think those are the important and valid points. I think it's great we can all, you know, stand by and look at the panels and cut the panels and walk away. But at the end of the day, that's not going to be sustainable energy. It's not going to be sustainable clean energy if we don't actually build in that longer-term vision of how we can get anything and capitalism. Um, so we're running a little short on time, so now I'm thinking of condensing the last two questions um, because I'd like to return to the ministers just to look a little bit at um, how they are managing actually the scale up. And so to Tamar's point, um, how do they, based on what you've been learning through the project and looking at their impacts, how are you actually um, managing with sort of strategic or um, uh, different types of approaches? to scale up and then let's say sustain as well. That was going to be my third question, but let's look at how are you um, planning to, to be able to um, scale up first and then to sustain these investments uh, really over the longer term? Um, perhaps Ms. Thank you. Well, as was clearly mentioned, definitely the investments to make it to scale up this is possible, but uh, uh, and doable. But it really needs collective uh, efforts because it's obvious the why part because you are very intentional why are we still doing it? Of course, one is of course the priority how we are prioritizing it, but also it, it's obvious for countries like ours the resources to find this So uh, uh, what we are doing is one of the pillar focus areas in, in our national strategy uh, as part of. The inclusive infrastructure is a key plan to ensure electricity and water access and uh, waste management in all our facilities, but uh, prioritize in particular to make sure the water and quality of uh, energy access. And uh, we are using, of course, this is about the, finance, the financing model for the for health support. <laughs> it's a combination of uh, donor funds with government funds. In terms of improving uh, access for uh, some of our projects, of course, we have different kinds of projects to do uh, that we are trying to synergize. Uh, some of our projects are to be uh, so our uh, 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 dedicated projects, like what I mentioned earlier, which has co financing also from government to ensure that it sustains. So, as we mentioned earlier, one we build them, we need to sustain them in this co financing. Uh, they will also support that. Uh, so it's a combination of uh, donor funds, government funds, and, and the engagement of the private sector. Uh, but it requires 
uh, language of uh, uh, the process. So we have funds that come directly to government for the for the ministry, but who are the donors? We could fund the different in different donor resources in one basket and then invest on uh, these two pillars of uh, and system strengthening because sometimes it would be just one project and we not be able to do much. But if we have full resources, then we can so uh, many donors doing a work on things with these and it has to be good and which supports the infrastructure. And there are human sector projects I have mentioned earlier. We also have the financing uh, aspects in most of the most of the dimension, which is critical for the sustainable region, of course, because we need to have continue to increase the investment of government and domestic finances for from the different sort of different countries to really uh, continue uh, building on uh, the scale up of this. Yeah. 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 Bringing in the larger group of partners and funding partners is Somalia, how are you managing to sort of navigate these two issues of sustainability and scalability? For us, sustainability is a real challenge. We are a distinct solution for that problem. For example, uh, our first Lord San Martin was provided for two years, and now we lose the energy of local engines because the solar system is not functioning. So, uh, so it is easy to solarize the center, but the difficult thing is to sustain the system yeah. maintain. Um, uh, there are several key success factors. To sustain the solar system investment. An example, there is necessary to get the proper planning. Proper planning is crucial for the success of any solar system investment. Uh, this includes conducting through visibility study task, accessing the solar resource potential, analyzing financial viability, and considering any regulatory or policy requirements. And high quality equipment by investing in high quality solar panels in batteries and other system components is essential for long term performance and durability. And also, proper installation the experienced and certified solar installers is critical to ensure optimal system performance and longevity. Both uh, installation can lead to reduce efficiency. Safety hazards and also potential system failures. Uh, so, uh, what we are addressing now is the companies who uh, solarize the facility uh, to include the contract, the process of sustainability and maintenance to include the contract. So, a lot of um, uh, options that we are addressing now. To solve that problem, but it's real challenge. Mm -hmm. yeah. setting up those partnerships in country to really have the the uh, after installation support um, for the longer term view is, is, is vital, and making those partnerships and keeping those people uh, involved in 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 this type of development. So perhaps maybe Belinda, Maria, Anna, any final thoughts about scalability, sustainability, and maybe if we have any comments from the audience or maybe comments or questions from the audience around the whole scalability and sustainability question, which of course is uh, is really vital to making sure that we can we can sustain these investments. Um, yes. Yes. Hello, uh, my name is Claude Mayer. I'm uh, the coordinator of an international network on health financing and social health protection. And uh, I, I work in WHO in the Department of uh, Health Economics and Financing. Yeah, okay. And uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, Her Excellency, the Minister from Ethiopia, was playing music to my ears. <laughs> she, was, she was talking about pooled funding. Uh, she was mentioning the fact that uh, uh, this is something very important uh, for the long term sustainability and the fiscal dimension of what has been discussed here. 
of course, we fully agree. And in the P4H network, we see that this is very not often the case. Um, the other uh, comment I wanted to make is that concerning the development banks, the World Bank, the regional development banks that are members of the P4H network, by the way, we observe that um, very often uh, in countries that are the most in need, the focus of the projects are not on infrastructure, despite the figures that you have been mentioning and that are known by everybody. Uh, uh, where um, the focus is much more on the functioning of the system rather than really building the foundations of, uh, of this system. So it's also uh, a message I would like to share with everybody that uh, those kind of uh, discussions uh, take place uh, in our network. But the most provocative question I have, and this is uh, not actually uh, to the countries that are sitting here, it's about the rich countries. And it's about the agenda of de-energizing health or dematerializing health in Switzerland, in the United States, where the carbon footprint, the material footprint, and the energy footprint of those countries can be sometimes 80, 100, 130 times more than the countries in sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So I'm just introducing the dimension of equity in that conversation that yes, there is a, a catch up to do uh, uh, in terms of energizing health uh, in uh, certain countries, but there is also a balance to find uh, uh, in terms of uh, material footprint, carbon footprint, carbon footprints of the systems of the richest countries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, Maria, Camila, any final thoughts? Any relatives? Any relatives? Uh, I think we are uh, we are putting all the elements together, and uh, of course, the issue of financing is fundamental in all sense. For those rich countries, we need to decarbonize. We we have the attach uh, platform where we are trying to do that. Five percent of the global emissions are coming from the health sector. That you don't need to decarbonize. At all, you need to carbonize. But you don't want to be on this one. But you need to gain access to sources of sustainability, and yeah. they need to be clean. Otherwise, you will be making the same mistakes, and particularly creating a dependence that you have now on those fossil fuels that is not uh, not uh, safe and is not uh, good either. So, final remarks: uh, we need to uh, create at this moment at the COP28 when we were discussing about. Uh, uh, when we will have this health day on the climate change dialogue, and this might be one of the, the, the answers to the, where this full volume is coming from, because we need to meet that day, the COP28, with a clear uh, plan for the health sector to be financed on, 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 on climate resilient health care facilities, and the climate resilience comes as well with the energy transition health. So I really hope that at the end of the COP28 health day, we will be able to have a very strong, not only the case for investment, but I think uh, we have all the elements here, but the investment uh, in and, and, and a real one that allow the maintenance of the operational maintenance, but as well the, the scale up on all of the projects. So, that would be my dream. My yeah. COP28. COP28. <laughs> Everyone heard that. Yeah. So let's make that happen at the COP28. Any other comments? Yes, yeah, please. Thank you. This is uh, Dr. Obaha from the Health Network, the Minister of Health. So my question is in Somalia, we have two projects uh, for uh, in recent health. One is from under Linux, uh, one is under World Bank, and other is the WHO. What my question is, are, are you going to standardize and harmonize these equipment? And then how we are going to train our, our technicians that are going to, to repair and maintain this equipment? Thank you. Yes, thanks a lot. Uh, thank you for the discussion. I'm also an engineer, renewable energy engineer, but I received comments from my director once in a while, you are a health professional. No, wonderful discussion. And uh, yeah, just to follow up with our colleagues, when uh, Dr. Jama and you brought me in Somalia, in Mogadishu, in our cooperation with, uh, 
with the with the with the Ministry of Health, uh, Dr. Jama, and and have talked with this uh, um, central hospital in Mogadishu, and the director of the De Martino Hospital uh, told me, uh, you know, Salvatore, uh, we had uh, an anesthesia machine donated by an uh, Italian government, but this is practice. Uh, an anesthesia machine that got broken because unreliable electricity. So if in the narrative of what we have said now, we had the point of how many medical devices and equipment just fail because there is no reliable electricity. WHO, our colleagues for medical device division, we, we are working with them now, estimates that one third of equipment, one third of failure of medical equipment worldwide are because of unreliable electricity. So in addition to all the points that we mentioned on cost, saving, energy independence, CO2, uh, and fast deployment, it's, we had one third of medical equipment worldwide fail is for electricity. electricity. And this relates with uh, your point on the technical capacity at local level. In our work together with the country office and the Minister of Health in Somalia, we have selected, we have identified, selected one local company in Somalia. We are together with Circle Foundation training them. We are training them. Our partner from Circle Foundation hosted them in India to train them for two weeks. And now they are working in Somalia to do the operation and maintenance on the installation that we're planning to do together with the, with the minister and the virtual. So the point that was mentioned mm -hmm. also before, before is not an instant and forget, as we say in the report that Dr. Mayor said, is maintain there. It's, a, it's not difficult by itself. With solar energy, the nice part is not a rocket science. It's been there for 20 years. Uh, so the point is exactly to, to, to keep uh, to, 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 yeah. or just to uh, yeah. And I have a point on this one because I think that sustainability is really a very important point. It's not to install and forget, yeah. it's install and maintain. And yeah, and I understand all of the, the finance demonstrates that are behind the, 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 the sustainability. But I'd like to share our, our example with the Sierra Leone that they must have lost the last night. So in Sierra Leone, we partnered with FCBO, we implemented 90, 97 uh, mini grids to provide. Uh, energy and united uh, uh, health centers. But with the extent of the energy that we were generating, we start selling this energy to the population. Uh, by selling this energy to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the population that was surrounding you know, the, the health centers, we, are, we were able to attract the private sector. So, and by as well uh, working with the very closely with, with, with the government to um, Establish the right to regulation. The private sector is now you know, uh, managing these small inequities, and it is selling the excess of the, of the of the of the, of, the, of the power with this amount uh, with with this income that we are we are generating. These companies, you know, have ensured sustainability. They are the ones now, you know, investing in these uh, small mini grids, and they are the ones now with their own funds scaling them up. Mm -hmm. So I think that what we have done with the Sierra Leone with uh, the FCBO support, it is really a great example that should be really recommended across all of this. Thank you. So I think the Apache platform is, is a really uh, powerful tool actually to bring all of these kinds of lessons, sharing, advice, guidance. Um, and, I, and I think that's, you know, that's, that's really a locus of where we can actually start creating and sharing some of these key sort of success factors uh, in terms of sustainability. Certainly. Can I have some words? Um, yeah, I guess it's, you know, Perhaps that last word here to say is that financing is a barrier for um, solarization. It may come from different tools. And um, I hear obviously a lot of colleagues from the become on the focus on the health system, the soft core, if you will, reforms and so on. But we in the World Bank, for example, we do have trust funds. And one of the trust funds is the Energy Sector Management Assistance Program. Sorry, it's not as not for short. And what ESMAP has been doing, I mean, this is uh, this is a trust fund that sits in the energy global practice. 
but it does provide for funding and it leverages actually both IBRU resources also in, in, in that space. That's one point. The second point is that, you know, with this transformation that we're, uh, you know, we're embarking on in the bank around taking more of a health systems approach to climate, so we're integrating climate within our health system strengthening agenda, because of the focus also on the mitigation, many of our projects have started including mitigation, um, you know, um, uh, designs in them or interventions in them. And of course, the easiest one is solarization. I mean, it just becomes, it's an old brainer, it's an old regress, as, um, you know, as Maria was saying. So as soon as you include solarization of healthcare facilities in a project design, you've got the co-benefits, yeah? There are certain co-benefits which are a lot more difficult to account for using the joint multi, you know, uh, multilateral development bank uh, methodology. So I think it's really about um, commitments to say this is an regrets, um, you know, intervention. We have the ability to scale it up. Well, what do we do? We need our country clients to request from organizations like the World Bank and say. Okay, you financed a thousand uh, facilities, five hundred facilities, whatever. We're actually interested in moving further, um, you know, with these plans, and we can then discuss how the business model would look like. This is not just again about the public financing coming in, into it, or it's not just about you know the ODA, but it's also equally about domestic and the private sector and the roles, you know, all that. And I think that you know, in the bank, we can definitely facilitate that discussion. Um, not just through IBRD and IDA, but also with our colleagues in IFC in ensuring that we're bringing the private sector into these discussions. So let's go for it. Energize the health sector. I, no, I think you're absolutely right. We've got other key organizations <laughs> that can really contribute. We just need to create that demand. We need to show that it works. And we really just need to put those pieces together to say, okay, no regrets. Let's do it. Okay. Well, I mean, this has been a fabulous conversation. I, I'm not sure whether anyone else has any final, final comments. Otherwise, I would be yes. Last question. May I ask the last question? My name is Flora Wendel. I'm a family physician from Germany. Thank you for the um, interesting panel and showing um, initiatives that bring energy to the health facilities. But health facilities are not only lacking energy, but also water and waste management and others. So from, I have the health perspective, I know that there are several health programs that are still very parallel and not connected well. So how is this um, in the sector of infrastructure? Thank you. That's a good question. And I think this is, uh, I mean, the panel here today, I think it's showing that these worlds are more and more coming together because, I mean, we can go back hundreds of years and look at where public health came from it came from the infrastructure solutions mm -hmm. so i think this is uh, uh it's it's late in the day but i mean i do believe Sorry. that we've got <laughs> key sectors here together talking now about uh increasing this collaboration to really look at these issues from a different um from different angles but also you know really consolidating the capacity mm -hmm. the knowledge the skills the funding and really uh and, and really we just need to, to get on with it as Hannah said we just need to get on with it talk mm -hmm. prospect more let's get the job done okay well thank you so much it was a great <laughs>